I am the hammer! In the grim darkness of the far future, the Space Marines stand as the mightiest warriors of the Imperium of Man, the Empire encompassing the entire galaxy. These genetically engineered super soldiers are the ultimate defenders of humanity, created through a rigorous and complex process. Among the most curious aspects of these formidable warriors are their unique anatomies, which are a fusion of human genetics, advanced gene seed organs, and cutting edge technological augmentations. In this video, we dive deep into the intricate and awe-inspiring anatomy of the Space Marines, exploring the genetic modifications that grant them superhuman abilities, the extraordinary and strange implants that perpetuate their legacy, and the neural connections that enable them to interface with their power armor. From their impervious resilience to toxins and extreme environments, to their ability to absorb information through taste and smell, the Space Marine's anatomy is nothing like you've witnessed before. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you, let's begin. A comprehensive prelude to the creation of Space Marines. Before we get into who and what exactly the mighty Space Marines are, we need to understand where they came from, which universe they're set in, and what their purpose is. So, Warhammer 40k is basically a tabletop miniature war game by Games Workshop, but the dystopian world that it's set in has some of the deepest and most elaborate lore, at least as far as games are concerned. In fact, some compare Warhammer's lore with that of Frank Herbert's Dune. Anyways, coming back to Warhammer 40k, Okay, the primary events are set in the 41st millennium, but the actual story started in the 29th millennium. This was the period when the god emperor of mankind was leading humanity to a technological zenith, and humanity was at its peak, happy and satisfied. Naturally, the god emperor wanted more worlds under his domain, and set out to conquer the entire galaxy. To achieve this, the god emperor had built a massive army of genetically enhanced soldiers whom he named the Thunder Warriors. These soldiers helped the god emperor achieve what he wanted wanted, the conquest of the galaxy. Some say sky's the limit, but the god emperor was already conquering the depths of space, and being an ambitious individual, his thirst for greater achievement could never be quenched. So, as his next project, called the Primarch Project, he created a party of 20 uber-powerful genetically enhanced superhumans, whom he named the Primarchs. Since the god emperor had already conquered a vast sector of space, his next goal was keeping the peace and bringing prosperity to humanity that was now living across the galaxy. This this is reminiscent of an ancient Indian ruler named Ahsoka the Great. Ahsoka consolidated a major part of the Indian subcontinent through extreme bloodshed and carnage, but once he had achieved what he wanted, Ahsoka took it upon himself to bring peace, so much so that he himself converted to Buddhism and became a beacon of non-violence. It is said that Buddhism wouldn't have flourished as it did without Ahsoka. Likewise, the primary purpose of the Primarchs was to scatter across the God Emperor's domain and keep the peace. Remember, they were there to serve humanity and not rule it. But unfortunately, even before Project Primark could be completed, tragedy struck and the 20 genetically enhanced superhumans found themselves in far reaches of the galaxy because of a mysterious warp storm. A warp storm was a psychic phenomenon that disrupted space travel and brought in mutations and other abilities in humans. And this was when the God Emperor of Mankind decided to abandon Project Primark in favor of creating the Space Marines, an army of genetically enhanced soldiers who were based on the genetic material of the 20 Primarchs. The Space Marines, under the leadership of the God Emperor, conquered more alien races, of course, in the name of the Emperor and his vision for an advanced and prosperous humanity. However, the focus on military conquest and power led to a neglect of the interest of the subjects, leading to their corruption. Humans started to adopt a decadent lifestyle. They became corrupt and were plagued with greed. So it was decided that the Space Marines would be tasked with saving humanity, sometimes from itself. Furthermore, there were other factors and players in the equation, the most important of them being the chaos gods, ancient beings who wanted the corruption and destruction of all life in the galaxy. Then there were vicious and demonic alien races, and the space marines were to safeguard humanity from these beings as well. Who are the defenders of the galaxy, the mighty space marines? So, the Space Marines are basically the supreme transhuman warriors dedicated to serving and protecting the Imperium of Man. Now, what exactly is the Imperium of Man? Well, it's just the term for the entire human empire that's spread across the galaxy. 
but the Imperial citizens also include the likes of some humanoid offshoot species and a few subhuman alien races as well. Oh, and the Imperium of Man is sometimes also just called the Imperium. Coming back to Space Marines, these guys were genetically enhanced to become the strongest and most resilient soldiers of mankind. There were exactly one million Space Marines to cover the entire galaxy. To give that some perspective, the total number of active personnel in the US was 1.4 million in 2022. These million Space Marines were divided into a thousand chapters or units, with each chapter containing a thousand Marines. Each chapter was further divided into ten companies of a hundred Marines each. The division ensured better management of the Space Marines, and they became more effective and organized as an army. In fact, each of the thousand chapters can be considered a self-sufficient army that has its own spacecraft and is ready to make a move to the farthest quarters of space at a moment's notice, to eliminate anything that may threaten the peace of the Imperium. All the Space Marines are extremely proud of their chapter's heritage and history, and brandish their colors and heraldic markings with pride on their uniforms, armor, and vehicles. But if we talk about the physique and general outlook of a Space Marine, he's a humongous, transhuman warrior who holds inhuman skill and brute strength that could shatter the bones of a normal human with a single punch. His primary weapon of choice, called the Bolter, is a weapon that's capable of firing what they call mass reactive shells. These devastating rounds explode upon contact with the target's flesh, so you see, it's not something you want to get in the line of. Additionally, a Space Marine's power armor not only protects them from lethal blows and weapon fire from the fiercest of enemies, the armor also strengthens them and allows them to withstand the harshness of many hostile environments that they find themselves in due to the nature of their job. As a product of some insanely intensive training and mind-bending genetic manipulation, a Space Marine quits being a mortal man and assumes his rightful place as a deadly warrior, a living weapon of the highest order that mankind's arsenal has to offer. In fact, they attain a demigod status. But how are these formidable men chosen? What's the selection process like? And how are they created? Forging the Indomitable Space Marines, The Creation Process, Part 1, The Selection. The important thing to note here is that each of the chapters of Space Marines recruits young children as candidates. Children are chosen because their bodies and minds are more impressionable, and they respond better to the psychological and physiological implants that are needed to become a Space Marine. Space Marine recruitment is a diverse process, with each chapter employing unique methods to select and train new warriors for their ranks. Many chapters are closely tied to a single homeworld, where they rigorously test and challenge prospective candidates to identify the strongest and most devoted individuals. These homeworlds have primitive and technologically backward societies, fostering a strong militaristic culture. Young males showing promise are subjected to rigorous training and conditioning, with dreams of one day joining the esteemed ranks of the Space Marines, known to these communities as Star Warriors or Sky Knights. Feral worlds, characterized by their untamed and savage environments, prove to be excellent sources of recruits. Their inhabitants, molded by the harsh conditions, possess a natural fierceness and resilience that aligns well with the requirements of space marines. Among the most formidable candidates come from the depths of hive worlds, where life is defined by constant struggle and violence. The city scum, driven to extremes by the unforgiving conditions, often exhibit a nigh-psychotic killer instinct, making them ideal recruits for the Space Marines. Despite their merciless nature, the authorities often turn a blind eye to their activities. Occasionally, some recruits are selected from more civilized planets within the Imperium, but such instances remain relatively rare. The majority of Space Marine candidates hail from the rugged worlds where strength, loyalty, and combat prowess are forged through hardship and trial. The recruitment worlds used by Space Marines serve as closely monitored breeding grounds for new recruits. Apothecaries and chaplains of the respective chapters maintain a watchful eye, ensuring the preservation of the population's genetic purity, which is crucial for fostering qualities that align with the Space Marine's objectives. But wait, who are the apothecaries and chaplains? Well, an apothecary is basically a super doctor who has advanced scientific training and biomedical knowledge, which he uses to serve as a combat medic and physician to a particular chapter. You can think of him as a sort of meister serving a house from the Game of Thrones universe. Furthermore, when apothecaries are not on a battlefield helping the wounded, they spend their time monitoring the adolescent space marine recruits or neophytes for mutations and flaws caused by the gene seed and organ implants. 
On the other hand, chaplains are warrior priests who administer the psychological and spiritual well-being of space marines from a particular chapter. Spiritual well-being is also a paramount concern, guarding against any taint of corruption from the ruinous powers. These observations are often conducted discreetly, with minimal direct contact between the societies and the space marines, or even the Imperium itself. Once in a generation, the chapter's officers might make brief visits to these planets, becoming the subjects of myth and legend. Held in awe, their words carry immense authority, revered by the local inhabitants. The trials set forth by the Space Marines for aspiring recruits encompass a wide spectrum of challenges, each extraordinarily demanding, with only a select few successfully overcoming them. Some trials involve ritual combat, hunting formidable beasts, or performing perilous acts of strength and valor. Failure often results in perilous consequences, and only those deemed worthy are chosen to join the Space Marines, leaving their past lives behind forever. Having said that, the process of Space Marine recruitment is a momentous occasion for families, even among societies with limited awareness of the broader galaxy. A notable example is the Space Wolves, whose wolf priests search the tribes of Fenris for the bravest and strongest youths. Conversely, the Ultramarines typically draw candidates from the elite training barracks of Ultramar, a collection of planetary systems under their domain. Other chapters lack a single homeworld and traverse the galaxy in fleets of battleships, recruiting from various worlds or the war zones they're assigned to. Notable fleet-based chapters include the Black Templars and the Dark Angels. Accepted aspirants become neophytes, embarking on rigorous training and biological enhancements. Each chapter upholds unique traditions surrounding the neophyte's initiation into its legends and secrets. This transformation involves both physical and spiritual changes, influenced by battlefield experience and participation in chapter rituals, which vary significantly among different chapters. So yes, even before you begin to become a space marine, you're supposed to go through certain changes. These rituals can be solemn, commemorating the Emperor's sacrifice for humanity, or they can be lively celebrations, drawing from the chapter's homeworld culture. Others adopt a more brutal and primal nature, involving bloodletting, scarification, or even amputation. Yet, all rituals play a crucial role in the chapter's arcane workings and serve as a prerequisite for acceptance among the neophytes' would-be brothers-in-arms. The demanding training often claims the lives of many aspirants. In the journey to becoming a space marine, a neophyte may face challenges that lead to rejection, such as crippling injuries on the battlefield or spiritual inadequacy during particularly arduous rituals. Transgressing chapter laws may also result in expulsion or injury as modes of punishment. Those who fail to meet the rigorous demands may encounter various fates. Many undergo a process of mind-scrubbing transition into chapter's serfs, who are dedicated manservants and menials. Others, less fortunate, face a transformation into cybernetic servitors, biomechanical automatons devoid of consciousness, serving the chapter's tech marines and handling hazardous machinery. A select few, though exceedingly rare, might ascend to positions of relative authority within the chapter's feudal household. However, even the highest-ranked factotum remains a lowly, anonymous servant in the eyes of the esteemed Battle Brothers. Now, let's say you get chosen as a candidate. What happens then? Well, there are trials. These are kinda like the Witcher Trials, but probably way more rigorous and risky. Part 2. The Trials Aspiring candidates seeking to become Space Marines must go through a series of demanding trials before earning acceptance into the ranks of a chapter's neophytes or adolescent Space Marines. The initial trial stands as the most significant event in an aspirant's young life, leaving a lasting impact on their mind and heart throughout their potentially lengthy existence as space marines. Each chapter within the Adeptus Astartes uses distinct and diverse trials to assess aspirant worthiness, and it has further variations because the aspirants may belong from one world or another. Some disguise their traditional festivals and rites of passage as trials, overseen in secrecy by chaplains or senior chapter serfs. Aspirants, unaware of the true purpose, believe they participate in tribal rituals, and only the most promising among them will be selected to become Space Marines. In other cases, aspirants engage in combat to vie for the esteemed honor of being deemed worthy, though the exact nature of the reward remains mysterious. Some trials are closely observed by the chapter's servants, meticulously judging every step, while others focus solely on the trial's outcome. Trials can be extremely grueling, often leading to the failure and mortality of many aspirants. Yet, those who survive garner significant honor within their culture, 
earning recognition as heroes and potential future leaders. Upon completing the trial successfully, an aspirant is taken to join the chapter as a neophyte. The process might involve the guidance of a space marine leading them into a new life, or they may find themselves in an induction cell without prior knowledge. Regardless, their triumph allows them to become a neophyte, though more tests remain to determine their eligibility for the sacred and life-changing gene seed organs of the Astardes. Let's check out a few of these trials, shall we? The Blood Duel Trial This trial takes the form of a combat duel, often resulting in a fight to the death. On feral worlds, tribes might employ flint-tipped spears or the fierce fangs of untamed beasts. While feudal worlds, characterized by a medieval level of technology, engage in highly ritualized swordplay. More technologically advanced imperial worlds utilize a wide array of lethal weaponry for these confrontations. Typically, the blood duel is conducted in rounds, where aspirants face multiple foes until only a select few remain. The number of rounds can vary depending on the chapter's need for recruits. If a significant number of neophytes are required, the trial might end when a predetermined quantity of aspirants survive. Conversely, when the chapter needs fewer new recruits, the trials may persist until a solitary challenger stands amidst the bodies of fallen adversaries. Hunting the Hunter Trial The Hunting the Hunter Trial, also known as the Trial of Morkai, is used by the Space Wolves chapter in the selection process of their neophytes. This trial is designed to test the aspirants' prowess, cunning, and determination as they confront dangerous predators that inhabit the homeworld of Fenris. Some predators are of human origin, such as the Gelt Scalpers preying on the outcasts of Hive societies, offering rewards for their eradication. Other aspirants may confront alien raiders on frontier worlds, ranging from the lethal Drukhari to the savage green-skinned orcs. During the trial, the aspirant must track down and defeat the chosen predator, demonstrating their worthiness to become a neophyte in the chapter. The hunt is a rigorous test of the aspirant's combat abilities, intellect, and adaptability, as they find themselves in their vicious and dangerous prey's territory. The duration of the hunt can span days, weeks, or even longer depending on the trial's conditions and the weapons the Aspirant can procure or craft. Survival of the Fittest Trial Many worlds from which Space Marine chapters recruit are characterized by perpetual warfare among numerous smaller tribes, resulting in a constant state of conflict and bloodshed. In such societies, formal trials are often unnecessary. Instead, the Space Marines observe these incessant wars from a distance, identifying the most exceptional heroes and victorious leaders among the warring factions as potential aspirants. Hive worlds, particularly the lawless underhives and polluted ash wastes between hive cities, frequently fit this description, where savage gangs battle relentlessly for supremacy, catching the attention of the chapter's servants. In some cases, the Space Marines actively play a role in instigating strife and conflict. They may limit a society's technological advancements, restrict access to resources, or introduce disruptive elements like chapter surfs spreading misinformation and paranoia. Exposure Trials In this trial, aspirants are subjected to harsh and perilous environments on various worlds to test their survival skills and fortitude. Most worlds in the Imperium are characterized by dangerous conditions, such as pollution, radiation, hostile life forms, extreme climates, or other inhospitable factors. During the exposure trial, aspirants are sent into these treacherous environments, often without aid or advanced survival equipment. For native aspirants who hail from such challenging worlds, the trial strips them of all assistance and forces them to rely solely on their own skills. Completion of the exposure trial is not always the expectation, as many trials are designed to be nearly impossible, with aspirants simply aiming to survive as long as possible. Those who endure the extreme conditions without faltering, often surpassing expectations, are deemed worthy by the chapter's apothecaries to become neophytes and join the ranks of the space marines. Some exposure trials even involve transplanting aspirants from familiar environments to entirely foreign ones, testing their adaptability and resilience. Knowledge of Self-Trials This trial involves various methods to test the aspirant's inner fortitude and resilience. One approach involves subjecting the aspirant to psychic visions induced by a chapter's librarian. During a trance-like state, the aspirant faces horrifying visions and irresistible temptations, confronting creatures from their deepest nightmares and phantoms implanted by the librarian. 
The librarian presides over the trial, evaluating the aspirant's very soul. Another method involves administering potent psychoactive substances derived from venomous predators or rare plants to induce profound psychological experiences. The aspirant must confront their own inner terrors, often surpassing the intensity of visions created by a librarian. Exposure to pain is another common variation of this trial. Different techniques, ranging from primitive to fiendishly inventive, are used to inflict pain on the aspirant. Some torments leave lasting scars, proudly worn as symbols of mental strength. Other methods, like the infamous pain glove used by the Imperial Fist chapter, leave no visible marks but directly interface with the aspirant's nervous system, keeping them conscious beyond their usual threshold for enduring pain. The Challenge Trial The Challenge Trial involves the aspirant facing a full-fledged Astartes in a duel or competing in other challenging ways. While the aspirant is not expected to surpass the Battle Brothers' skills, success is often gauged by the degree of their failure. Occasionally, an aspirant manages to defeat an Astartes, earning legendary hero status within the chapter. Many challenge trials focus on martial skills, with the aspirant engaging in an armed duel against an Astartes who may fight unarmed and without power armor. Despite these conditions, the aspirant's chances of victory are incredibly slim, and most challenge duels end in the death of the young contender, as even an unarmored Astartes is vastly superior in size and strength. So, now that the recruits have been selected to become a space marine, they get various implants and organs, the most important of which is the gene seed, which is not a seed per se, so what is it exactly? And how does it affect a space marine's anatomy? Well, let's find out. The Gene Seed The gene seed of a space marine is a vital element that gives unique physical enhancements to potential Astartes or space marines. Originally engineered from the genomes of the Primarchs, the Emperor's genetically engineered sons, the gene seed is a rare and precious resource for the Imperium space marines. Each space marine chapter possesses gene seed cultivated from one of the Primarchs, representing the essence of that particular chapter's distinct characteristics, including mental, physical, spiritual, and martial traits. The gene seed develops into specialized organs, which are implanted into aspiring space marines during the transformation process. In the ancient past, the biotechnology required to create new gene seed was lost to humanity, leading to the reliance on retrieving it from fallen or dying space marines. Chapter apothecaries oversee the creation of new space marines from the raw recruits using the retrieved gene seed. Over time, space marine gene seeds are susceptible to mutations, which can manifest in various ways. These mutations are often influenced by the genetic code of each primarch, resulting in unique traits or flaws for each chapter. For instance, the Blood Angels suffer from the flaws known as the Black Rage and the Red Thirst, while the Space Wolves bear the mark of the Wolfen. Such mutations may lead to challenges or benefits for the chapter in question. While Black Rage is an extreme psychological mess, Red Thirst is an unquenchable thirst for blood, and it is quite vampiric in nature. Exploring the most curious organs of the Space Marines There are a total of 19 implants and organs that Space Marines have to take. These additional gene seed organs further amplify Space Marines' physical capabilities, augmenting their endurance, adaptability, and sensory prowess. Each implant plays a vital role in empowering these superhuman warriors for their arduous and perilous missions. Number 1. Secondary Heart or the Maintainer the first implanted organ, the secondary heart, increases blood supply and pumping capacity. It can take over if the primary heart fails and even administer steroids or adrenaline for battlefield advantages. Number 2. Osmodula or the Iron Heart This implant accelerates and strengthens the neophyte's skeleton by inducing bone absorption of a ceramic-based mineral. Within two years, the Space Marine's skeleton becomes larger and much stronger, reaching around 7 to 7.5 feet in height. Number 3. Biscopia, or the Forge of Strength Implanted in the chest, this organ greatly enhances skeletomuscular development and muscle fiber density, unleashing a surge of growth hormones to increase physical strength. Number 4. Hemastamen, or the Bloodmaker Implanted in a major blood vessel, this organ alters the biochemical composition of the blood to carry oxygen and nutrients more effectively. The blood appears brighter red than that of normal humans due to its increased oxygen-carrying capacity. Number 5. 
Laramin's organ, or the healer. Located in the chest cavity, this organ produces laramin cells, synthetic biological cells that serve as fast-acting clotting agents. They prevent massive blood loss and infection. Number six, catalepsian node, or the unsleeping. Implanted into the cerebrum, this gene seed organ allows space marines to forego traditional sleep. Instead, they enter a trance-like state, resting their minds while one hemisphere of their brain remains alert. Number seven, preomnor, or the neutralizer. Positioned in the chest cavity, the preomnor functions as an organic decontamination chamber connected to the digestive system. It can analyze ingested substances and neutralize various toxins, enabling space marines to consume normally inedible or potentially harmful materials and resist poisoning. Number eight, omophagia, or the remembrancer. Implanted in the upper spinal cord, the omophagia integrates into the central nervous system. This gene seed organ enables space marines to absorb information and genetic memories by consuming the flesh of alien creatures. We'll cover this in more detail in just a bit. Number 9. Multi-lung or the imbiber. This allows space marines to extract oxygen from environments with low oxygen levels, which would typically hinder normal respiration. By using a specialized sphincter, the multi-lung facilitates breathing while filtering out toxic elements in hazardous surroundings. Number 10, oculobe, or the eye of vengeance. Situated along the optic nerve and connected to the retina, the oculobe enhances space marine's visual acuity and grants exceptional eyesight. Number 11, sus -an membrane, or the hibernator. Positioned near the pituitary gland within the brain's endocrine system, the sus -an membrane allows a space marine to enter a state of suspended animation or hibernation. This implant proves invaluable in enabling immortally wounded Astartes to survive until proper medical attention can be provided. It helped one space marine survive for 567 years. Number 12, the melanochrome. Interlinked with the endocrine system through the lymphatic system, the melanochrome gene seed organ modifies the pigment cells in a space marine's skin. It allows the Astartes to withstand hazardous levels of radiation and extreme heat. Number 13, oolitic kidney or the purifier. Working in conjunction with the preomner, the oolithic kidney filters the Astartes' blood to remove ingested or inhaled toxins. Additionally, the oolitic kidney functions as a regulatory organ for the Astartes' physiology, maintaining the efficiency of their advanced circulatory system and the proper functioning of other implanted and natural organs. Number 14, Neuroglottis or the Devourer. Placed within the mouth, it allows a space marine to biochemically assess various substances simply by taste or smell. The Astartes can test objects for toxicity and nutritional content, determining their edibility or potential poison. Number 15, Lyman's Ear or the Sentinel. This gene seed implant gives space marines immunity to dizziness and motion-induced nausea, enabling them to resist the disorienting effects of sonic attacks. Number 16, Mucronoid or the Weaver. Embedded within the central nervous system, the mucronoid gene seed organ responds to specific environmental chemical stimuli. When activated, it prompts space marines to secrete a waxy protein substance akin to mucus through their pores, sealing their skin. Number 17, Betcher's gland or the poison bite. Consisting of two separate glands implanted inside the mouth, including locations such as the lower lip, salivary glands, or hard palate, Betcher's gland works in tandem. When triggered, it transforms a space marine's saliva into a corrosive, blinding acid. In dire situations, this corrosive substance can enable an Astartes to chew through barriers, like iron bars, in order to escape captivity. Additionally, it aids in digesting otherwise challenging or indigestible substances, such as cellulose. Number 18, the progenoid glands. Positioned in the neck and chest cavity, progenoid glands serve as reproductive organs for gene seed collection and gestation within a space marine's body. They respond hormonally to other gene seed implants, generating germ cells with identical DNA. These cells, stored within the progenoid organs, can be cultured by the chapter's apothecaries to develop each of the 19 gene seed organs required to create a new space marine. Number 19, the black carapace or interface. Arguably the most crucial gene seed implant, the black carapace is a neuroreactive, fibrous, organic material placed beneath the skin in the chest area of an Astartes neophyte's hardened ribcage. 
fiber bundles grow inward from the implant, interlinking with the Space Marine's central nervous system. Interestingly, pre-cut points on the carapace serve as neural connection points, facilitating a direct interface between the Astartes' central nervous system and their power armor's machine spirit. This link grants enhanced protection and combat maneuverability, surpassing what an unaltered human wearing the same armor could achieve. The Significance of Gene Seed Survival to Space Marines The survival of Gene Seed holds immense significance for Space Marines, as it is crucial for the continuation of their chapter and the creation of new Astartes. Basically, without Gene Seed Survival, the chapter would cease to exist. Progenoid glands, also known as the Gene Seed, are implanted in the neck and chest of adolescent Space Marine neophytes. These organs respond to the presence of other gene seed implants in the body, generating germ cells with identical DNA through a process similar to cellular mitosis. These germ cells are stored within the progenoid organs and can be cultured by the chapter's apothecaries to develop each of the 19 gene seed organs required to create a new space marine. The progenoid glands represent the sole form of reproduction for most Astartes, passing on the DNA of their Primarch rather than their own. The mature progenoid organs are typically harvested after the death of an Astartes by the chapter's apothecaries, using a specialized tool called a reductor. The extracted gene seed is then used to replace losses within the chapter, providing a form of immortality for the space marines. To ensure genetic purity and detect mutations, the tech priests of the Adeptus Mechanicus monitor the gene seed of every chapter. A gene seed can be rendered non-functional by radiation exposure or corrupted by the chaotic energies of the warp. Monitoring and maintaining genetic purity in gene seed is vital, both to uphold the integrity of space marine chapters and to ensure the availability of resources for the future. Do space marines get smarter through cannibalism? I wouldn't use the term smarter, but they definitely become more knowledgeable because of their cannibalistic tendencies. The Omophagia, also known as the Remembrancer, is one of the genetically engineered gene seed organs implanted in a space marine neophyte contributing to the creation of a superhuman Astartes. This unique organ is connected to the spinal cord and directly linked to the cerebral cortex and the stomach, forming a part of the brain itself. Through the consumption of flesh, the Omophagia enables the space marine to acquire partial memories and experiences of the consumed individual or creature. By absorbing genetic information, including DNA, RNA, and protein sequences related to memory, this implant allows the Astartes to learn through ingestion. The gained information is transmitted to the Astartes' brain as biochemical memories or experiences. The presence of the Omophagia has given rise to distinctive rituals within certain space marine chapters, involving flesh-eating and blood-drinking practices. Chapters such as the Blood Drinkers and Flesh Terrors are named so because of these very rituals. It is worth noting that mutations in the gene seed related to this implant have resulted in some chapters developing an unnatural craving for blood or flesh. But at the end of the day, a Space Marine's intelligence and cognitive abilities are primarily enhanced through extensive training, genetic modifications, and the combination of multiple gene seed organs, rather than solely relying on cannibalistic practices facilitated by the Omophagia. But if you ever come across a Space Marine asking you questions, just tell him whatever he wants to know, instead of resisting and becoming his lunch. Nutrition and Consumption in the Lives of Space Marines well, do space marines eat anything besides flesh and blood? Of course they do. Nutrition and food consumption are just as important in their lives as ours. While each chapter may have unique dietary customs, the space wolves are renowned for their feasts, including the consumption of a special alcohol called miod, known to affect their gene-enhanced statures. During battles, space marines often rely on nutrient paste and carefully designed chemical diets to maintain peak performance. However, they also have the flexibility to enjoy full meals for pleasure and enjoyment, utilizing designated areas like the refractory within their fortress monasteries. In situations where the nutrient paste is unavailable on the battlefield, space marines put to use the organ called the preomner. This pre-stomach organ neutralizes poisonous and indigestible substances before passing them to the stomach, allowing the battle brothers to ingest whatever sustenance they can find, even if it may not be conventionally edible. In emergency situations, space marines can consume a wide range of materials, from plants and animals to enemy forces. So yeah, they could just eat their fallen enemies. Just how intelligent are they? The intelligence of space marines encompasses various aspects, with notable strengths in spatial and numerical intelligence. 
They possess remarkable computational capabilities, enabling them to conduct trajectory calculations swiftly and effectively during combat situations. However, their social intelligence tends to be limited, as their training as transhuman child soldiers emphasizes extreme violence as a solution to problems, leading to difficulties in social interactions. Space Marines undergo extensive hypno-indoctrination and education, equipping them with a wide range of knowledge. They demonstrate proficiency in sciences, mathematics, and a broad spectrum of Imperial weaponry, crafts, and vehicles. While their expertise might not match that of specialized tech marines and apothecaries in their respective fields, all space marines possess a foundation of understanding and can access hypno-education to acquire specific knowledge when required. I personally think that it's essential to differentiate between intelligence and knowledge. Are there any female space marines? The absence of female space marines in Warhammer 40k has prompted discussions and diverse opinions. But you know, we shouldn't really get into the ethics of this, there's no point in discussing if it's a good thing or a bad thing, and we should just agree that it is what it is. In the Warhammer 40k lore, the in-universe explanation is that female individuals cannot become space marines due to genetic and physiological factors. The gene seed, which is crucial for the creation of space marines, is designed to be compatible only with the hormonal balance and genetics of human males. Attempts to implant space marine gene seed into female subjects would lead to severe complications, organ rejection, chemical imbalances, and ultimately result in a painful and agonizing death. The real-world explanation is more complex and not definitively established. In the early stages of Warhammer 40k, Games Workshop produced a limited number of female space marine models. However, it is alleged that these models didn't sell well, leading to their subsequent discontinuation. The commercial decisions made in the 1980s regarding the availability of female space marines may have influenced the continued absence of female representation in the faction. And female space marines would be kind of superfluous because we already have Sisters of Battle and other such sub-factions comprised of women. Can they reproduce after they survive the process of becoming a space marine? Well, the lore clearly says there's only one way for a space marine to reproduce, and that's through their progenitor glands, so I guess there's no point in discussing this further. And, moreover, there's been no instance when a space marine actually copulated or even kissed a girl, so it's safe to assume that they do not reproduce sexually, even if they're not entirely sterile. Are they immortal? Space Marines are genetically advanced and technologically augmented super soldiers, and let's just add the term super to all the adjectives. Naturally, they possess remarkable resilience and longevity, though they are not truly immortal in the conventional sense. Physically, Space Marines exhibit extraordinary durability, capable of withstanding injuries that would, to ordinary humans, prove more than fatal, if there was such a thing. Their enhanced physiology grants them immunity to many poisons and enables them to survive in space for extended periods. However, they are not impervious to harm, and sustained damage can lead to their demise. Space Marines perpetuate their genetic legacy through a unique process involving their progenoid glands. Upon death, these glands are extracted and used to implant genetic material into prospective Space Marine recruits, representing a form of hereditary continuity and a kind of asexual reproduction. Additionally, the transformation into a space marine halts the aging process, allowing them to exist indefinitely without experiencing the effects of time. Their immortality, therefore, lies more in their impact on future generations through their genetic lineage and legacy as formidable warriors. Marvelous Verdict In conclusion, the anatomy of a space marine is a marvel of genetic engineering and technological augmentation, from their gene seed organs that give them superhuman abilities to their advanced neural connections that interface with power armor, every aspect of a space marine's body is meticulously designed to create the ultimate warrior. Their organs and enhancements not only enhance their physical prowess, but also grant them unique abilities, such as resistance to toxins, heightened senses, and the ability to absorb information through taste and smell. That's all for now, but if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Thanks for watching, be safe out there, and have a marvelous day.